Hello, I'm Mark Schildhauser, and because things on the internet seem to lose their date reference, it's pretty easy. Today is Saturday, July 22nd, 2023. On Monday, June 5th, 2023, uh, returning from on our big vacation from San Diego County to Vancouver, British Columbia for a Disney Wonder Alaska cruise. We stopped at the Evergreen Air and Space Museum in McMinnville, Washington. Uh, comments, if there were a couple of places I would like to go back and see, this is one of them. It was a uh, fantastic two huge building facility. The docents were great. Uh, the snack bar was more than adequate. Uh, I'm gluten free, not by choice, by medical. Uh, no wheat, no rye, no barley, and they do gluten-free sandwiches, so, uh, and they were really big, and they were fairly cheap, too. I was impressed. <clears throat> I really enjoyed it. Uh, I took, I think, 643 photos, um, drained two batteries on my digital camera, and at that point, uh, we were tired. Uh, we were out of battery power, we still hadn't seen it all, but we also had a fairly long drive to our next stop, so it was time to move on. This was a super museum. I'm contemplating the two-day drive to get back to it. So let's get on with the tour. I'm going to show you about 35 to 40 minutes of, of the museum. As you're driving up to it on, I believe it's a state highway, this is the sign that's out in front of the museum, so it's easy to spot. This is the entrance. Uh, it's a really beautiful building, really beautiful structure. And when you walk in, this is one of the very first things you see. Uh, so, um, <laughs> and, and we were there partially for the Spruce Goose. Uh, the, Hughes Kaiser HK1 Hercules which has other names too for some reason. Let's get on with the tour. The HK1 which is Hughes Kaiser 1 Hercules commonly called the Spruce Goose is actually made out of birch. It is the mainstay of the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon. We toured it while it was still in Long Beach, and here are some photos as we go through it. This is a massive aircraft, 8 R4360 Pratt Whitney 28-cylinder engines, massive, powerful engines. And a number of these panels that I'm going to show you talk about how the Spruce Goose got moved from Long Beach to McMinnville, uh, who flew it, and they talk about uh, common folklore, we'll say, uh, Howard Hughes uh, flew the Spruce Goose alone. There were a number of people in one of these slides uh, show it. It wasn't airborne for very long, and it also suffered uh, structural failure during that flight, and I don't have any good pictures of the damage by the tail. It involved a lot of technology uh, that had never been used before to create a buying boat and they really pushed it. The two players that were key in this, and everybody knows Howard Hughes, most people do not know Henry Kaiser and yet Henry Kaiser was one of the biggest uh, industrialists in the United States if not the world uh, before, during, and immediately after World War II. Kaiser Aluminum, the Kaiser Cars, Kaiser Shipbuilding, the Liberty Ships, whatever. He really advanced it and he substantially uh, influenced the HK-1's construction. The only portion of the massive Kaiser system that was out there during World War II what is is now Kaiser Medical. That's all that left and that was started by him taking care of his employees during World War II and as I understand it he charged his employees something like 25 cents a week for full medical dental and vision protection for their families. Some pictures of how the Spruce Goose was built, the material structures, uh, concepts that were built uh, that were used to to build this massive aircraft and it is truly like 95% wood 
birch. To move an aircraft of this size from Long Beach to McMinnville, Oregon was a massive undertaking and actually took quite a bit of coordination not only between people and assets like barges and cranes but also between people and nature so that they could get it under the bridges and across the roadways that it was going up to. As you can see in these photos when you have eight R4360 28 cylinder Pratt & Whitney engines on your aircraft you have hydraulic systems and whatever else it's more than a one-man show there were numerous control stations throughout uh, the forward area on the flight deck of the HK-1 and we got some decent photos of them and there were a number of seats and if you look at how they were set up there were a number of seats to carry people some were passengers some had functional obligations evidently as they sat in those seats my wife and I as you saw paid the extra fee to get into it and the beach balls that you see in the one photo have an interesting um, facet to this. Hughes was concerned that if he did suffer structural damage to the aircraft that he could uh, sink portions of it so he had beach balls inflated in numerous places in the ship as long as well as rubber bladders. This picture is the ADF antenna. Normally you would see this on the top of the aircraft. This aircraft was wood. It didn't need to be on top. It was inside. Probably reduced drag. You could walk out and service the engines through these portholes. This is looking out the wing of the HK-1 from the flight deck. It was pretty cool. And the logbook of the first flight is annotated by what looks like a Mr. Smith. There were several things that were notable at the museum, a lot of things that were notable at the museum. They had a really nice uh, POW MIA table and it just caused you to step back and contemplate it. They had a memorial statue to uh, Michael King Smith, Mr. Smith, the founder of Evergreen Aviation, uh, his son who died in a tra tragic car accident and a really interesting uh, compass rose. I would love to be able to build a compass rose like this in my backyard. Uh, the inner design looks a little too complex for what I can do with brick. Several aircraft were on display inside, outside, and some with really good signage, uh, some with no signage at all because they were in storage or they were in work or whatever. The uh, Convair F-102 Delta Dagger was outside, so its sign took a fair amount of weather. But if you look at this aircraft, and I'm going to show you the F-106, its successor, and uh, being here in San Diego with Convair at Montgomery, near Montgomery Field, talked to a number of people who worked for Convair, and there are some interesting tales in whether they're folklore or, or fact. One of the things was uh, it was intentionally designed into the F-106, the Delta Dart, that the top of the tail be clipped, that it not come to a point as this, as it does on the F-102, as you see here. And that was so that when you're looking at it in profile, you could tell the difference between the F-102 and the F-106. Folklore effect, who knows? This is the F-106. It was outside. Its sign was very seriously weathered. If you look at this in profile, you'll see that the top of the tail is clipped so it's flat. It does can come to a point like the F-102, making it very distinct in profile or distinctive enough in profile. Well, they talk about the fact that the inlets uh, aren't the same in profile. You wouldn't notice that. So, it, who knows if it's fact or fiction. Now, being a naval aviator and having flown in the Western Pacific Indian Ocean, numerous other theaters, uh, Middle East or Desert Storm, whatever else, uh, I've had Soviet aircraft come up and fly formation on me, including a MiG-21 when the guy comes up and he's flying wing on you and there's two F-4s flying right behind him, you still don't feel safe. We built complex multi-role that are expensive. The Soviets prefer single or reduced uh, mission capability defensive aircraft. 
ours are extremely expensive theirs are relatively cheap not cheap relatively cheap and ours are maintenance nightmares I'm being somewhat sarcastic they require a lot of maintenance because they are so complex uh, theirs are relatively simple so the concept is would you rather have a thousand aircraft and inundate your enemy with pure numbers or would you rather have a hundred aircraft that can do many many things against your enemy the Soviets go for a hundred for a thousand we go for a hundred the MiG-23 Flogger, which is variable geometry wing, similar to the F-14 Tomcat. I don't know what the internal structure is. If you look at the nose gear on this, uh, it has shields. And those shields were in place, supposedly, to keep water from being ingested into the engines when it landed on rough fields. Another thing that the Soviets are good for. The F-89 Scorpion was sitting outside. This Northrop product was probably in the uh, mid-1950s to mid-1960s. It's a big interceptor. It was designed to be an interceptor, all-weather interceptor, and there's a number of them on display elsewhere. I kind of like it only because I'm a Scorpio, but it, it's, a, it's a big airplane. It had no signage because it was outside. Another outside aircraft that was on display with signage was the Northrop F-5E, the Tiger II, which is the single-seat version of the T-38 Talon uh, trainer, and this was initially designed for um, foreign exports, as I understand it, from other resources, and it was adopted by a number of countries. Very effective, and also used as aggressor aircraft in both the Navy and Air Force uh, fighter schools. We come up to one of those interesting things that just <laughs> unmanned aircraft operating off of U.S. Navy ships, and this one here is part of the development stage to get what would be later called the MQ-8 as I remember, and uh, unmanned air vehicle operating off of small boys. I'm a Grumman guy. I love Grumman. I've got more than 5,000 hours flying various Grumman aircraft, and they've got a uh, G21 Goose on display powered by two um, R985 Pratt Whitney's. These aircraft saw a number of services, both civilian and military, and anybody who flies Grumman appreciates the fact that they build good airplanes. Another airplane sitting outside without any signage is the Grumman OV-1 Mohawk, and this is a U.S. Army uh, and Argentine military um, flown aircraft primarily for battlefield intelligence. They were flown very heavily during uh, Desert Storm uh, to gather intel, signal intel on what the enemy was doing. Powered by two uh, Lycoming T-53 turbo turboprop engines. This is a Grumman F-9 Cougar. It's a two-seater, and Blue Angels uh, number no. seven is traditionally a two-seater aircraft, so it's probably an F-9 FT, whatever. Um, it's a uh, 50s vintage jet. This particular aircraft is a Douglas F-5D Guy Lancer. Don't see a whole lot of them around. Interesting aircraft. Again, outside, no signage. And it looks like it's being worked on since its wings have been pulled. Grumman F-14 Tomcat, as I said in another video, Grumman likes to name their aggressor aircraft, their, their uh, offensive aircraft, um, after Cat. The museum did not have a Lockheed P-38 on display, but what they did have was this display about the attack on Yamamoto and the uh, a portion of the fuselage of the aircraft that was recovered um, from the one that he got shot down in, which was pretty interesting. The museum's Lockheed F-104 Starfighter, which is just a neat name to give an aircraft, was beautifully painted. Interesting. Wonder if this was ever an operational squadron. There was an SR-71 on display. I didn't get a full picture of the aircraft. There's SR-71s in numerous museums. That's not an issue. This one here had a different presentation, though, because they had opened it up uh, as an engine change so you can see how they were doing an engine change and I'd never seen that before that was that was uh, unique 
The museum does not have a Hughes XF-11. They do have a model of it, and if you are familiar with the history of Howard Hughes, Howard Hughes was flying the initial one of these. He stayed airborne longer than the engineers told he could. He had an oil leak in one of the engines. He lost control of the aircraft, crashed it, and it's believed this is the crash that caused his head injury, which changed his personality, changed his attitude, and probably changed the course of aviation history because he became a recluse and he had mental issues after the crash. Among other things, Hughes built a number of very, very safe, successful helicopters. This is a Hughes 269. If you look at the skids, uh, his helicopters had the design feature to crash and be safe and we'll step over to the Hughes 500. It went into military service as the OH-6, uh, commonly called the Loach. If it crashed and it was in a forward motion, uh, the aircraft literally disassembled into an eggshell and then rolled for long distances until the energy was dissipated, protecting the crew, which is really cool. Step over to another aircraft, and that aircraft is going to be the Sopwith Camel and really nice. This is not an original. This is a replica and it was built from uh, many of the original plans using as much of the original techniques as possible. Find what looks like a Bell 47. It's actually a Navy HTL series and they talk about how the HTL series 1 through 3 develops. This was actually a version, I guess, of the Bell 47, which is famous for its MASH appearances and the Korean War and with the concept of rotor wing flight proven developments came along. The uh, 13E, the, the Su, the Bell 47 model is shown here in the configuration that we all know from MASH and the Korean War. Now we have an issue um, that we have now proven how successful these aircraft can be in a uh, military support role. We step up to adding the turbine power to them and we get the UH-1. The Iroquois, as it's referred to, or Huey, because of its original designation HU-1, which was read as HUI, as um, became the uh, helicopter aircraft that we commonly refer to or know of out of Vietnam. And in this photo, it's sitting underneath the Spruce Goose to give you an idea how big the Spruce Goose is. A derivative of the uh, UH-1 is the uh, Bell AH-1 Cobra, and it comes in various versions too, as the uh, Huey or Iroquois does. Single engine, multi-engine, they've now increased the number of rotor blades, and there is an issue with the teetering rotor blade on the Huey and on the Cobra. If you put in excessive controls, you get what's called bump mast, where the yoke taps the mask, and because of gyroscopic effect, you're probably going to lose the aircraft. Not what you want to do. And in, in the photo, it's sitting next to the Huey, which is under the Spruce Goose. The Lycoming engine, which runs these guys, uh, incredibly small for the amount of power delivered and uh, engine technology has substantially increased efficiency wise uh, since the very early jet engines. If you ask somebody what a Beach D-17 is an aviation enthusiast, chances are he doesn't know. If you ask him what a staggering is, he'll probably tell you. The staggering was uh, a unique by uh, biplane because its upper wing was behind its lower wing, not in front of as the conventional uh, uh, biplane would have been. And it is a beautiful airplane. The twin beach, Beach 18, uh, Beach C-45, depending on what role it is, has a number of names. I've made a couple of flights in one of these. It was a C-45 that was being used for to run mail. It's one of the few times I have been truly scared in an airplane. Uh, the maintenance on it was absolutely horrible. They were trying to hire me to maintain it and to fly it, and I walked away from it. I was so disappointed. I love the aircraft. I think the aircraft's beautiful. It's a great airplane, whatever. 
what killed the opportunity I had was the airplane was in such poor shape I wasn't willing to touch it. If you give me the opportunity to talk about airplanes or spacecraft, I'm going to go to airplanes. I love airplanes. I think spacecraft are neat, whatever, but I love airplanes, and that's what I've flown. There's two portions to the museum, an aviation side, aircraft side, and a spacecraft side. So uh, I shifted over to the spacecraft side for a little while. I'll, I'll go back to the aircraft side in, in a bit. When you walk in the door, uh, as you look to the right, you see a V-2 and what looks like a V-1, only to find out that the V-1 is actually this JB-2, and it's a loon, it's a clone of the V-1, built in the United States to be used in the uh, invasion of Japan, which did not happen. Looks like a V-1, sounds like a V-1, flies like a V-1. And with the V-2, uh, they give you a, quite a bit of information, which I thought was really cool, and how to start the rocket engine. And the V-2 was the first object to leave, man-made object, to leave Earth's atmosphere. I really like the quote from Bernard von Braun. I have learned to use the word impossible with the greatest caution. Yep. Mercury spacecraft, this is number 10 in the production that McDonnell Douglas made 20 of and several of them didn't fly. This one was a test model, but it shows you how big this thing is. Um, I, in watching the movie The Right Stuff, the phrase was made, we're spamming a can. Uh, and at that time, the aircraft didn't even have a window. They would later modify it before the first flight to give the astronauts a window. The museum had a really good sequence of displays for the Mercury, the Gemini, and the Apollo missions, and I'm just going to kind of leaf through them. Uh, I didn't keep real good track of them. As I said, uh, I, well, I like the space program. Uh, my interest is airplanes, and the airplanes were across the street. They had these panels that talked about the missions, and sometimes they consolidated the missions. Uh, they had one of the lunar lander trainers or simulators um, sitting there, which was kind of cool. Um, I'd seen others. And they had numerous tools, uh, and since logic says they left the original tools on the moon, why, why use, why consume weight unnecessarily on, on tools? They have no emotional or, or scientific value once, once you've used them. And they had a lunar rover and I wonder if this one needed uh, duct tape to fix a fender. A spacesuit that was looks kind of bulky considering the ones they've got now. Stepped over and this is the front end of a Titan I uh, motor engine, missile motor, missile engine, whatever you technically call it. And this is a little better shot of the entire one. And this is a Titan missile. I'm not sure what version. I, it might be a version Titan 4, Titan 6. I, I'm not sure. I didn't keep track. One of the things they had that had my interest, uh, just because I'm curious, is this is the uh, Soviet R7. And they talk about how the R7 was used to put various things in space for the Soviet Union, the Russians, and this, they made big, big missiles. They put a lot of engines on their on their missiles and uh, made sure they were going to go. This is one monster, monster engine, as you can see. Uh, it had me totally impressed. I would normally crop a photo to uh, cut my my image size down so you can see the issue, the, what I'm trying to focus on uh, in, in detail. This I'm going to leave open so you can see the size. This is a solid rocket booster or SRB that would have been on the space shuttle program. And if you look at the ends, I think this is where those seals that caused a Challenger failure um, to occur would go. How do you get something into space? Multiple stages. Uh, it takes a lot of energy to move one pound, one foot vertically. Try lifting up a gallon of milk and then realize how much energy you're going to have to put underneath that in a gaseous state. If you can uh, go back to Star Wars, if you can get rid of the liquid fuel stuff and use some sort of uh, gravity repulsion system that doesn't, you know, whatever, figure out Star Wars. 
back in 1901 I think it was I'm gonna check 1901 somebody some Russian said hey uh, you might want to try liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen and it would later be used very effectively there were a number of rocket missile engines running around I understood or learned rockets as being ballistic you fire them and and wherever they go they go and missile you fire it and then you can guide it so these would have actually been missiles most of them anyways in this particular slide, and I'm going to show you the text in detail, talks about a mega engine that was being developed that could produce as much as 2 million pounds of thrust. It was canceled before it got very far. And that's a picture of the nozzle. Believe it or not, you saw where I ran out of battery power over on the space side. So I'm going back to airplanes, not to ignore them. The uh, Beach Model 35, which is the V-tail Beach, was a very popular civilian aircraft. A number of people didn't like its tail. A number of people didn't feel any difference in flying the V-tail. Beach 35 was also the basis for the Beechcraft T-34 Mentor. I flew the T-34 Bravo. The difference between the Alpha for the Air Force and the Bravo for the Navy is the Alpha left the nose gear doors on it. The Navy took the nose gear doors off. The Air Force required a bungee centering system for the control stick and the Navy said get rid of it we want to fly the airplane without assist. I looked up I did not fly this bureau number those six numbers on the back of the fuselage. The Ryan PT-22 recruit and most of these were probably built in the San Diego area most likely at Lindbergh Field it was a trainer and as you can see it was soloed from the back seat and it was soloed from the back seat uh, because it's center of gravity was unchanged when you put a person in the front seat but if you took the person out of the back seat and put him only in the front seat to solo from the front seat the center of gravity shifted too far forward and that was typical of a lot of these aircraft the two seaters that sat like this normally would be soloed from the back seat Hanging in the overhead is the Teledyne Ryan AQM-34 Firebee. These were early UAVs. They were launched from a C-130 uh, to fly over enemy territory to gather intelligence, primarily photo work, uh, then return to a fixed point or a predetermined point, parachute, uh, shut their engines down, pop a parachute, and then be caught by a helicopter and lifted, carried by the helicopter back to base. There are a couple of models throughout the museum. This one's a P-47 model that was uh, excellent detail and, and they gave quite a bit of history why it was there. It was modeled after a very specific one that was flown. There are numerous aircraft that I've either flown, worked on, or seen as a pilot or a mechanic and the Republic CB is one of them I've seen. It, it, guy used to fly in the Chicago Midway when I was a ramp rat up there and I absolutely for some reason loved this airplane loved the idea of being able to land on the water or on uh, the ground and I would love to have bought one of these I just think it's a neat looking airplane the uh, Republic F-105 and the Spruce Goose uh, HK-1 Hercules is in the background you can see this is a this is a monstrous airplane in the foreground and a really monstrous airplane in the background and a Fairchild Republic A-10 Thunderbolt 2 now this is the Thunderbolt 2 because the P-47 is the original Thunderbolt the museum had two versions of the DC-3 if you want to call them that and they had this beautiful one sitting inside really nicely polished up it looked like it was undergoing some work and they actually let you climb inside and this is what the interior looked like wish we had seats like this in airliners today you actually probably had elbow room and leg room outside they had a c-47 and the c-47 skytrain goonie bird a number of other things uh, there were also derivatives of this of the dc-3 as the uh, r4d and the c-117 and the c-117 has gear doors and some other stuff so here's the um, Skytrain C-47 and how you tell the difference primarily is you look at this door. This is a big cargo door. You can barely make it out but this is big enough to take large boxes. It's not just the walk-in door. 
the Douglas A4 Skyhawk, fantastic aircraft. Uh, I think the comment is Ed Heinemann's hot rod. He's the guy who designed this. Fantastic aircraft. This one here is a base model. No hump in the back in the bottom right hand corner of the sign. You can see the hump in the back which makes it, uh, It's I think it's referred to as an A4 Super or whatever. It's what the Marines would fly. Head enhanced avionics and, and whatever else. Blue Angel flew it for a number of years. The McDonnell Douglas F4 Phantom II because McDonnell had per, had uh, built a Phantom earlier in the jet age. Fantastic aircraft and I mean, it's still flying in the world today. The North American SNJ or AT6 Texan and there are a couple of versions of this out and I understand that one of the versions you can tell the the difference by looking at the tail and by seeing if it has a roll bar type support in the canopy. Uh, I flew in an SNJ and it's referred to as a small navy junk but it's a beautiful airplane it's just being harassed um, by its name. This was parked outside it's a T-39 North American Sabre liner and it's obviously been modified to do some research type work. I flew it as the uh, CTF the uh, CT39F-G I think is its designation. Uh, we didn't have all these modifications. It is a fun airplane to fly. The North American X-15, The this X-15 still has its dorsal fin attached to it. When it comes in for a landing what it's going to do is it's going to drop that dorsal fin and then the, the skids will come out and uh, then it will land on its skids and it just slides along. Measure Schmidt 262 and they had a really nice uh, version of it um, sitting the example of it sitting there on the floor and you can see the Spruce Goose HK1 Hercules in the background again it dwarfs anything around. I love finding airplanes that I didn't know exist and this one is unique. I've never seen this one before, Taylor Craft Austere AOP.6 and this was produced for the Brits in uh, the late 1930s I believe and you can see it's influenced because it is using a de Havilland Gypsy engine. Uh, it's a upside down four cylinder engine. The Sikorsky H03 takes me back to the movie The Bridges Over Tokori where Mickey Rooney is flying in to save William Holden uh, when he gets shot down during the Korean War. Uh, Sikorsky builds helicopters very well. They build a number of different things. They built a lot of seaplanes as well throughout their history. The Sikorsky H19 Chickasaw, they, this was a really nice display and I've worked on one of these. and. Uh, they mount um, these large radial engines backwards so to speak. The What would be the prop shaft is not facing forward, it's facing back. It's a shaft that goes between the pilot and the co-pilot to a transmission that's behind the pilot and co-pilot. The uh, shaft for the rotor is going straight up, the shaft for the, t for the uh, tail rotor is going straight back. But it's a huge uh, large radial engine mounted in that beautifully done. Uh, a lot of good engineering. Now this one here, the Sikorsky UH-34D Seahorse, the photo is not associated with the write-up. The Army names helicopters after Indian tribes. There is no Seahorse Indian tribes. The Navy names their helicopters after sea creatures. So the write-up is for a Navy helicopter but the photo in on the plaque is, is a uh, Army helicopter. For the Army, it's the Choctaw. The PT-19 Cornell by Fairchild is in the museum. Really nice airplane. Painted in typical training colors for the Army Air Corps uh, in the 1920s, 1930s. Back out on the ramp uh, behind the museum, here's a Cessna 310, most likely an A model due to its vertical fin and it what's called uh, tuna tanks on the wings. This is probably an A model. I've got a couple hours in 310s, love flying them just because they're one of the classic airplanes. The Cessna 02 Skymaster, occasionally referred to as the Super Bird Dog, was in the museum inside. It really looked nice and every time I see this airplane and we saw one up in Washington State, every time I see this airplane what comes to mind is the movie Bat 21 
where Gene Hackman and Danny Glover work together to get Gene Hackman out of North Vietnam. The Granville brothers come in with another GB, uh, G Granville Brothers B, uh, Model E Sportster. They just had a habit of taking the biggest engines they could find and find and putting them on the littlest airplane they could build to carry the engine. Uh, every time I see one of their airplanes, I absolutely love it. It's it's a work in engineering that, as uh, reading some history on it, with these, because they were short coupled and they usually had small rudders, you had to be rare, really gentle on takeoff. Glenn Curtis and Curtis Aircraft give us the D3 headless pusher. This was a uh, 1912 aircraft, so it's following the Wright brothers. Glenn Curtis and the Wright brothers were in court numerous times. The Wright brothers usually won patent infringement and they seldom ever got their money. Here's another Curtis CW A22 Falcon. It looks like it's a, a late 1930s, early 1940s trainer for the Army Air Corps. It's uh, for its based on its star on the side of the aircraft. Looks streamlined, looks slick. Curtis Model 51 Fledgling. This is going back to 1927. I'm looking at the sheet and uh, airplanes are improving. These are quote unquote the uh, the modern modern aircraft in the late 1920s. Powering this aircraft is the Curtis R600 Challenger. You need to look at the this radial engine closely because I missed it until I read the sheet. This is a six cylinder radial engine. Most radial engines in have an odd number of cylinders in each bank and this one does. It has three cylinders in each bank. It wasn't successful most of the people took this engine off their aircraft due to vibration issues and reliability and replaced it. The Valti BT-13 Valiant was a trainer during the late 1930s into the 1940s. Beautiful airplane. It had fixed gear so it was probably an intermediate or basic trainer. Focke-Wulf 190 is in, in the uh, museum very nicely uh, positioned up against the HK-1 Hercules Spruce Goose and shows how magnificent both those aircraft are. Associated with this display was this painting of a Messerschmitt uh, BF-109 uh, flying wing on a Boeing B-17 and there is a story that goes with it where the pilot had the option to shoot the 17 down and decided that due to the damage already inflicted he wasn't going to do that. The LTV A7 Corsair II, Corsair II because uh, Vought, uh, the uh, Her uh, legacy company of LTV, had produced the F4U Corsair during World War II. This particular F uh, A7 is an Air Force version and if you look right behind the cockpit you'll see a slight hump uh, in that brown camouflage. That's the refueling uh, receptacle for boom to receptacle fueling. Well, I was getting my airframe power plant license. Uh, one of the numerous aircraft we worked on were Hillers, and this one brought back um, memories. And our helicopter guys would talk to us about these. And with the Hiller, and if you look, there's a set of paddles on the Hiller. With the Hiller control system, you control the paddles. The paddles, through gyroscopic effect, control the rotor blades. Interesting system. As we wrap up this session with the uh, Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in McMinnville, Oregon, which was a fantastic trip. As I said, I have a lot of photos. You've only seen a few of them. This is the Learning Center and Amphitheater that is on the facility and people can use it. And next to it is underneath the 747. If you look at the 747, uh, there's this tube thing sticking out the back. Um, that's probably part of the water slide. This is a water park. So, hope you enjoyed the tour. Uh, if I were to go back to the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum, I'd probably plan on two days because my preference is to take the photo of the signage, take a good photo of the airplane, and then read it. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed it.